people and you know um, the number of uh, good values i uh, i tell about him is is completely less um, and basically i, I cannot express uh, you know how cool this person is um, and and we are completely grateful uh, to uh, to have mr uh, shimas blackley with us today mr shimas blackley is a kind of a person uh, you know uh, who you see uh, in movies itself because you know he is a physicist and he also created uh, 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 you know out and out you know sony people will probably kill me for this but you know the best gaming console <laughs> in the world uh, and and all of us here at the CYWF uh, are, are completely uh, uh, grateful uh, uh, to him for taking uh, some time out of his very uh, busy uh, schedule for us um, and and basically uh, you know i cannot thank him enough uh, for this uh, uh, so mr blackley uh, did his bachelor's in physics from tufts university after that he went to fermi lab and did some research uh, and and after that um, uh, uh, some brilliant things happened because of which he created the xbox working with the likes of bill gates uh, and and he is currently the ceo of uh, of a pretty uh, wonderful uh, company uh, in computer science and you know um, yeah basically his story is completely inspirational to everyone thinking that uh, that science only lies in academia and that scientists uh, uh, can only em employ th their skills in universities or labs um, and you know he is he is a complete outlier uh, and uh, and we are very very uh, grateful to have uh, to have uh, mr blackley uh, with us today so um, yeah uh, so so my first question to, to, uh, to you is uh, were you always into science uh, 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 from your primary school or your high school days, you know. First, thank you for having me, and thank you for saying all those nice things. Um, I, you know, it's good because you, you know life is hard, and and uh, inside of your head, you you know, you always are very critical of yourself. And so, having somebody say so many nice things about me is nice. I hope that five percent of them are true. Um, so, <clears throat> to answer your question, yeah, I mean, I think all of us who are interested in science. Um, you know, discover it very early on. And whether or not we listen to that, um, you know, is a different thing. Um, I have a very good friend uh, who was a professional baseball player um, and found himself sort of in this career of pro professional baseball where a lot of people would be incredibly happy, uh, but it wasn't the right thing for him. And so he, he remembered this voice in his head from when he was small and he went back to school to community college Right, and now he's getting a PhD in theoretical high energy physics from the University of California, um, and you'd never think this, right? But it's somehow built into some people's curiosity about everything that's beautiful and cool in the universe, and I don't think you can you you can't ignore it, right? It drives you to do everything. Um, so yeah, from a very early age, and I think you have the same experience, and I think everybody who feels passionate about science has that same experience. It's like noticing things. Uh, about the universe and you know it's like a, an addiction once you start getting into science you know like um, yeah yeah this is more stronger than any kind of alcohol ever built and yeah absolutely uh, so, uh, so like uh, yeah yeah uh, so uh, so I've seen that you are pretty uh, active on Twitter and that is how we started to to interact with each other and the profile picture of the faces that you have on Twitter is is Ludwig Boltzmann. So, uh, 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 so basically, that begs two questions: Is a statistical physics one uh, your most favorite part of physics? And secondly, um, is Ludwig Boltzmann your favorite physicist? Uh, well, so I have I, you know I don't know if I have a favorite physicist or even scientist, but Boltzmann his you know his story is very compelling to me for a, com a couple of reasons, and um, and also you know the story of statistical mechanics and thermodynamics is really compelling, and it's sort of a, uh, a microcosm for I think a lot of things that are the very very best things about science and about physics certainly. Um, 
So uh, if you give me a second, I'll tell you why I love Ludwig Boltzmann so much, okay? First of all, he was a crazy, crazy character. Uh, his hobby was drinking beer. Um, he went on tours all over the world in the 1800s uh, for beer. Uh, there's a, 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 a book <laughs> he wrote about his travels to California to try I beer in California, California. Right? right? So yeah. in... You know, the, the late 1800s, he traveled all that way just to try Anchor Steam beer, which you can still you can still try. And you can also read Boltzmann's critiques and, and ideas about uh, about it. And he he writes in this chapter, this this wonderful introduction. He says he he says her professor closes his notebook and sits up from his desk. He puts his 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 coat on and walks down the stairs and, and goes to the door of the physics building and says hello to the attendant and then turns left. And the attendant says, Herr Professor, why are you turning left today when always you turn right? <laughs> and I say to the attendant, because I am going to California to sample the beer, right? And he really wrote that, this is Boltzmann. We think of him as this like, you know, crazy old guy, but he wasn't, right? He was a lunatic, it was great. But worse, he was, he was bipolar. He suffered from serious depression. He would go into rages. Some days he would bring a loaded gun and put it on the lectern in his lectures, pointed at the students. And other days he was everyone's best friend because he struggled with, with this disease. And against that backdrop, his accomplishments are even more impressive, right? But it shows us that everyone with a struggle, you know, anyone with a struggle, even a major one like that, can make such a contribution to the world. And moreover, uh, you know, he had a, a type of a scientific insight, a piercing insight that was so powerful. You know, he was, for instance, great friends with Charles Darwin. He was an early proponent of evolution. Uh, unfortunately, this made him a lot of enemies. And, you know, if you're a depressed person, and you have enemies, it's very hard to take. Worse, worse. His work in thermodynamics and, and the beginnings of statistical mechanics, of which he is the father, you know, um, convinced him rightly that matter is indeed uh, made up of atoms of, of uh, you know, inseparable small bits that behave according to the laws of physics. And, you know, it was really only 1906 or so uh, when the rest of the world agreed that matter is made of atoms which sounds very recent to most people. But until then, you know, driven by religious concerns, cultural concerns, historical concerns, most people really thought matter was continuous. And so these people who were saying that matter was made of atoms were, uh, were shunned. Um, Boltzmann was burned in effigy. Uh, Boltzmann would go to church with his wife and the guy giving the sermon in the church would rail against Boltzmann, say that he was wrong, say that God said that matter is continuous. Right? Can you imagine this? Especially as a depressed person, right? But he stayed with it. And he stayed with it, and he wrote down, um, you know, all he he wrote down all of his work in in a, in a way that we still use today. We still use his variable names today. That's how good he was. Okay, but really, uh, you know, he faced an incredible amount of criticism, and, and it, it ended up, you know, with him not being able to handle it, and he killed himself in 1903. And unfortunately. This was only uh, three years before no less than Albert Einstein in his famous paper on Brownian motion would prove Boltzmann entirely correct. And not just entirely correct, but as I said, Boltzmann's formulation, the form of his formulation, even the variable names are still the ones we use today. And it came from a tremendous physical insight of the kind that I really love. You know, the, there's a way of thinking about Einstein's work in gravity as the realization that Maybe if you can't tell the difference between being accelerated, like in an elevator going up, or being in a gravitational well, maybe the fact that there's no way to tell means they're the same. You know, and that seems like a very simple jump, but it's not. It's never a simple jump at the time. It's heresy at the time, right? But then you carefully go through the work and you look at the numbers and you see, oh, like, it's all self-consistent and it makes sense. And this is the great leap. And meanwhile, you have to realize that the people down the hall and your neighbors and the guys at the newspaper are all just hating you and telling you you're wrong the entire time. It takes a huge amount of courage to do this. 
So Boltzmann couldn't take it, but his insight into statistical mechanics grew out of, you know, a problem that really came from the, the commercial business of steam engines in that the Newtonian dynamics that had, had, had enabled the industrial revolution was failing with heat. Nobody could understand what this heat was. They called it the caloric. People were having trouble with the caloric. Newtonian dynamics, it predicted accurately the, well, as accurately as they could tell, the motion of all of the heavens, everything they could see, every building, every bridge, every structure, every machine, all of it, it all worked, except this damn steam engine. Trying to make it more efficient. How, why is it not more efficient? How can that be? So a lot of people had a lot of theories about it. And Boltzmann really had, you know, uh, again, he, you know, like all of us, he sat on the shoulders of giants. There's a lot of thinking that came before him, but it came down to just a simple equivalence again, which was if I have a brick, let's say, uh, and I hold the brick over a flame and then I take it into the other room and I measure its temperature, I see there's a temperature rise. Okay. If I do the same experiment, but I take the brick out of the room and I rub it with a cloth and then I quickly take it back into the room and measure its temperature. I can't tell the difference between the temperature rise due to mechanically rubbing it or holding it over a flame. So Boltzmann said, maybe there's no difference. <laughs> maybe that means that heat really is mechanical in nature. And if it's mechanical, then it must be the result of the mechanics of things we can't see, so small, tiny things. And so maybe Newtonian dynamics is right. Maybe it's just that we have to apply it to all of these tiny things. But there are too many. I can't write down an equation of motion for all of them. So let me think, and this is his second great insight. This is similar to Newton having an idea about the nature of, of gravity and of dynamics, but then having to also invent calculus to describe it, right? Boltzmann has this insight and he says, okay, it's mechanical. But I don't, I can't write down an infinite number of F equal MAs, right? So what the hell am I going to do? Or Lagrange and the Hamiltonians. What am I going to do? Well, okay, I'm going to have to treat this as a statistics problem. I'm going to have to say there are a lot of them. What if I treat them as all of them at the same time, right? And he figured that out. And out of that, he realized that he, there were other quantities that were important, entropy, enthalpy, like statistical correlation parameters that turn out to actually be physical, that turn out to actually have deep meaning. And he saw those. And of course, he was persecuted for those the entire time, right? So this is why I love Boltzmann, because he was a real person with real problems, real issues, and he was a goofball, and he was a tragic character, and we owe him so much. That is, you know, quite a testimony to uh, 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 to probably, you know, one of the best uh, and most underrated geniuses uh, physics has ever seen. And, you know, probably most of, of our young viewers wouldn't even know who Boltzmann is or, you know, what kind of contribution he has done. But, you know, what I can tell, you know, what I can add to what Mr. Blackley said uh, is that, you know, uh, basically, if you have ever heard of, you know, the wave function in quantum mechanics in any of your pop science videos or, you know, in any Lagrangian, Hamiltonian or stuff like that, you know, uh, there is something known as the partition function, which Boltzmann, you know, uh, was, uh, was quite pivotal in creating. And basically, you know, that is as important to, uh, to you know understanding thermodynamics as you know those those lagrangians hamiltonians or the wave function is uh, for for classical mechanics and uh, and quantum mechanics and you know that's right it, it, it's one of those things that boltzmann had, had to do in order to treat mechanics statistically yeah. and in one of the, these beautiful things if you pay attention while you're working you, re, you realize sometimes that an artifice a tool that you're making that you think is just a tool i'm just going to use this as a convenience to make this calculation. And you realize, oh my God, this, this, is, this is a fundamental thing, right? You've discovered something extraordinary if you just pay attention, right? And that's the thing, like, you know, there's this, there is beauty in the universe, deep, rich beauty. That's not like the pretty colors on flowers, although that's extremely beautiful as well, but there's a deeper kind of a beauty, a dynamical beauty, and it shows itself in strange ways, right? And if you if you train yourself to see that beauty, like there's such magnificence, like in the in the universe, um, and you know this is true of 
so many of the people who built all of the foundational science that we that we see today. But I, I think that the thing I want to tell you know I always want to make sure to tell people about, especially people who don't know very much about science who are just learning, is that we get this idea that science is this giant marble edifice that's been the way that it has been all along and that the scientists are these like geniuses, you know, who look down from, no, like they were people like us and they were insecure and worried about things and they couldn't get a date just like us. And they persevered through all of that and still did great things. And you can be inspired by that, right? All these guys, it's crazy. Irving and worried Schrodinger, about things, you know, who 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 wrote down the, the famous Schrodinger equation, Schrodinger's cat, quantum mechanics, all of that stuff that people know. He had this idea that he could only do good physics after having sex with his mistress. Yeah. So he actually set himself up an office in a hotel and would go with his mistress to the hotel. They would have sex, and he would immediately run to the desk and work. <laughs> okay, Maxwell. Maxwell's hobby was taking poetry. Like then, and and you know, there was a lot of you know poetry that was famous at the time that he was alive, and sharing poetry and writing poetry was kind of like social media for those guys. But he would convert it to having filthy lyrics. So so he would change the words to being to being uh, body and filthy and sex and farts and poos and all this. This is Maxwell, okay? That's what he did for a laugh. And people, he was apparently brilliant at it. And people would be like dying listening to him doing that. And then he'd go back to the lab and write Maxwell's equations. And, and, you know, it's important to remember that all of these guys were young people once. They did crazy stuff. They drank too much. You know, they had, you know, sex with the wrong person. All of that. All of those things. They're not these crazy, you know, people. And I think we need to respect them even more for that. I mean, yeah. it's easy for a god coming down from on high who's a genius to, like, you know, think of these laws. And I think that's a way that we cope with our insecurity as human beings. We think, well, of course, that god genius could come with that law. No. What about the the kid who got beat up in school because he was too thin? You know, little Jimmy Maxwell, right? He only became James Clerk Maxwell OBE, you know, famous guy buried in 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 uh, Westminster Abbey, because he overcame all the bullshit uh, and followed his insight and worked really hard on it. And I think that's more impressive. That's more intimidating. That's more fantastic. Else to that, because you know that is you know probably you know completely uh, and completely uh, self-contained. Yeah. So on to my next question. So uh, so you did your undergrad from uh, from Tufts uh, uh, University. Uh, so mm -hmm. uh, uh, so I just wanted to ask, um, uh, like, what uh, you know, what kind of changes did your you know time in undergrad as a physics uh, as a physics major made? to your view of the world and physics and you know what mm -hmm. kind of professors inspired you the most in your undergrad well so i started out uh as an electrical engineering major uh and i nearly failed out of college because i was also a musician and i uh had made a recording studio in the basement of my friend's apartment and i spent all my time doing that and i had a jazz band and i'd play at clubs and so I almost didn't study. And so I, I think I got, uh, I had like an F average for two years and I wasn't going to graduate. Um, but uh, I had had a really good physics teacher in high school. And uh, I was, I really loved it, right? But for some reason, you know, I don't think that, I think that a lot of young people, and I was certainly one of them, I could never imagine myself being a physicist. Because to be a physicist, you have to be this like serious genius guy, right? Like the picture of Boltzmann you see, right? You know, they probably, for that picture of Boltzmann that I have as my, on my Twitter profile, they probably had to try for like half an hour to get the guy to shut up and stop smiling, right? I mean, and that's the thing that you don't see. Like they were probably laughing and he was like wiggling and his kids were coming up or something. But you see him as this really serious guy, but that was not the, probably not the case at all, Okay. So I couldn't imagine myself doing that. And I think a lot of people can't imagine themselves doing it. And so I went and did other things. And it was really just when I realized that I had to find, I had to find uh, something to study, to major in, that I could finish in two years, because I only had two years left. And I only had money to, for four, four years of school. Uh, and so I looked at, and, and, and the only two departments at the university that 
would let you do that, right? Because like history or political science or law, you know, you have first year class, second year class, third. But in math and physics at that time, they didn't care <laughs> if you just got all the credits. So if you took them all at the same time, you can do it. So I went to the math department and I didn't feel it. And I went to the uh, to the physics department and it was all of these guys uh, who had um, who had been able to get out of going to the Vietnam War in the 1960s by going into science and they became high energy physicists and they had a separate building and in it they were working uh, at for, for Fermilab and they had like accelerator parts and detectors and it was like this giant machine shop with like hydrofluoric acid and liquid helium and it was like oh my god and I just felt like I was instantly at home and uh, and it, what it did is is it it those professors and there there were two two in particular. Uh, one of whom was the, the the chairman of the department. They, they like all of us, they understood what it feels like to be unsure about that. And they essentially, they gave me permission to feel okay about doing, about doing the physics, right? And I think it's like, you know, a lot of times, like you'll see somebody, and, and I see this now, um, you know, hiring people, see somebody who's, who's really good, really good, really brilliant, probably has a good future, but they're unsure, right? And sometimes even if you're really good, especially at physics or math, like you'll see a student who obviously never has any trouble with the homeworks, understands everything you're talking about, is even bored during the lectures, right? And you go talk to this person and she'll say to you, I don't know if I'm any good at it. And that's society telling that person that this is too hard or re regular people don't do it. And, and it's on us to go to those people and let them know, no, this is what it feels like. You understand, isn't it cool? And you enjoy it and it's all right. It's good. It's okay to enjoy it. Come to our family. Like, come, come to, you, you'll see we're a good family, right? We take care of each other. And that's, that's what's really, really important. And, you know, uh, you know uh, yeah, uh, so, uh, so, uh, so I know that you started, uh, you know, as a major in electrical engineering and then you switched off to physics. But, uh, like, as you were saying that in the first two years of college, you were, uh, you know, uh, very close to feeling out. But in your sophomore year, you wrote a paper in the Journal of Magnetic Resonance. Uh, so, like, how did that come about? Well, so, so I had a summer job. The thing that really turned it around was uh, I had a summer job um, with... Uh, a research group in New Mexico where I grew up. Um, and uh, the guy who led that group is a guy called uh, Eiichi Fukushima, who is one of the founding fathers of magnet magnetic resonance in medicine, magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, uh, NMR. Um, we don't call it NMR in this country because Americans, when you say the word nuclear, they fucking freak out. So, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I got into his lab and he saw the word nuclear the they thing that I was talking about. So he saw this kid yeah. who so, should be doing things. Um, and so he so I gently took me under his wing and he started me thinking about things. And without even realizing it, suddenly I was, you know, I was designing antennas and I was doing mm -hmm. Uh, I was I was doing work in, in you know, some antenna design and I, I remembered um, a page from the Feynman lectures uh, book with a circuit in it. Um, and we ended up making uh, an antenna using that circuit. Uh, and that circuit enabled us to do real time imaging of blood flow in a, a baby pig that we put into the NMR magnet. And, you know, and that led to, to this paper. And so I did all of this work in the, in, in the time when I was there for the summer and then more when I got back uh, the, my sophomore year. And one of the guys in that group wrote it up and put me in his second author. And, uh, and it was a totally extraordinary thing. And so suddenly I'm a published guy in the Journal of Magnetic Resonance when I show up for my junior year at college. Uh, and I meet all these high energy physics guys. And, you know, the next thing I know, I'm taking, you know, I think I took, you know, 50% more classes than you're supposed to take. And I graduated with, you know, high honors and was off on my way to theoretical physics. That is, that is like completely inspiring. And, you know, um, uh, I think, you know, 
uh, I think in my own experience, you know, uh, obviously I don't have any kind of, of, of experience as compared to you, but you know, in my own experience, uh, uh, like, you know, I have had some, uh, uh, some friends, uh, you know, who were like, you know, uh, very bad at, you know, keeping up with the assignments and stuff like that. Uh, but you know, they're actually, you know, quite smart guys. So, you know, right. this is, um, uh, to all those people who think that, you know, um, your college grades, um, you know, is going to determine what uh, what kind of grad school you are going to go to or stuff like that. This is to all of them. And, you know, actually, I think in my opinion, uh, uh, like, uh, you know, your story uh, of, you know, publishing in your second year, I think, you know, even the best kind of, of, of students in terms, I think, wouldn't have published in this movie. And that is, you know, and that is completely overstyling. Uh, so, uh, uh, so like off my next question, uh, uh, so what made you go to uh, uh, to Fermi Lab? The, uh, the audio is the audio is getting pretty bad. Oh, um, okay, yeah, just a second. Yeah, is that why? So, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, is it okay now? No, it's still pretty choppy. Okay, just a second. Now? No, we, we may want to try to reestablish the connection to get better. Okay, wait a second. Um, oh, shit. I think it was going great. That's okay. I don't think it affected my last answer. No, no, absolutely not. Uh, just a second. Um, yeah, just a second. Just a second. No worries. Uh, so now, am I audible? Also, am I audible now? No, it's still bad. bad. So now, is it okay now? Um, it's still pretty crusty, but we can probably go on. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, sorry for the lags again. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, so yeah, yeah. Am I audible, right? Yeah. yeah. Does my voice sound all right? Because you have a lot yeah, of static yeah. on your. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. As long as, yeah. as long as it's working on your end, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 
uh, uh, so basically my next question was what got you into fermi lab um the the guys uh who i had met who were working on the fermi lab experiment at us um you know got me into fermi lab and uh and again i i sort of um you know, it was like you know, I accidentally got the opportunity to be a part of this like crazy, like science fiction show <laughs> um, at the Collider Detector at Fermilab where they were looking for the top work. Um, and, you know, at the time that was exceptionally exciting. That was just, that was just a remarkably exciting thing to be a part of that, you know, to be a part of really validating the standard model. Um, today, standard model is almost like a, you know, a bad word, right? Uh, because we feel like we've been parked with the standard model, that we're stopped by it. We have, um, you know, these string theory guys, supersymmetry guys, people talking about alternative to the standard model because we're like, we're bored with it. And we put all this work into sort of a non-verifiable path on string theory, which we could talk about. Um, and uh, it's important to remember that then, like back then, um, you know, uh, the prediction of this preposterously heavy quark um, was kind of the capstone of the work of a lot of people to understand the, you know, the symmetry-based um, uh, model of, of fundamental physics in the standard model. Um, and uh, it was, you know, just incredibly cool and exciting. And this size of the machines and the computing power and the people, you know, just getting to go to Formula to meet the people from the collaboration and to see just the, the sheer, you know, volume of mind power was incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, um, yeah. Uh, yes, that is incredible once again. And I think uh, that after the super conducting a super collider project broke down. That was the time that you went out of Fermilab, right? That's right. That's right. I, I was I was set up to do a postdoc uh, working in the accelerator physics group. Uh, uh, I don't exactly remember how the mechanism was going to work, but I was going to end up working on magnets because, you know, from my experience in NMR, I really enjoyed antennas and, and working with fields. And, and uh, the, uh, idea, the of idea of steering antimatter, antimatter was pretty great. And SSC got canceled. And there was another there was controversy, controversy that happened that as well that is that less well understood. understood. But uh, at, uh, at Tufts, Tufts, there was a there was phenomenologist was called Gary Getzman, Gary Getzman, really talented, talented physicist, theoretical, theoretical physicist. physicist. And if you don't know what a phenomenologist is, it's somebody who who spends his time trying to understand the relationship between theory and experiment, okay, basically. Um, and, uh, and Gary, Gary wasn't, a wasn't a part of the CDF, CDF collaboration, collaboration, but he was good he was friends, friends with my advisor, my advisor uh, a guy called Krzysztof Sliva. And Krzysztof and Gary, Gary uh, had, an had an idea about, about there possibly there being a top quark, quark signal in some data, data that had already been passed, passed over as not containing top. And they got and they some got good some results using a technique, but Gary was outside of the collaboration. There's actually a book on this. Uh, or a part of a book on this called the, the hunt for the top quark or the search for the top quark. Um, and a huge political mess ensued. And the CDF collaboration acted very poorly. And I'm afraid that, you know, uh, guys on the other side acted pretty poorly too. And it really exposed to me some of the ugly side of the politics of science and specifically big science. So when that happened and then uh, other ugly politics canceled the super collider, uh, you know, I suddenly felt like this home that I had been, that I had found and the, all these people in this place that I felt good and comfortable and accepted had suddenly turned bad, like overnight. It was terrible. And I remember actually sitting in my kitchen uh, in Massachusetts uh, when I was home from Fermilab and watching the the nightly news, because back then everyone had to watch the nightly news. <laughs> Uh, and the news came on, the super collider had been canceled. And that's how I found out. And that was it. That was, I was my career was kaput at that point, as far as I knew. So I, I started looking for some kind of like temporary job or something that I could do. Um, and I ended up replying to an ad on the physics bulletin board of the physics department. 
um, uh, looking for somebody to work on a car simulation for a video game. And at that point, video games weren't like they are now. They were all 2D. There was no physics in them. Uh, there was no 3D rendering yet, really. Um, but this was a company called Looking Glass that was doing 3D rendering. And because they were drawing the world in 3D, they discovered that they needed physics, that you couldn't use the same simple animation that you use in a 2D game. Now you had this much harder problem. And adding one dimension, as we all know who know about these things, adding one dimension doesn't just add one more dimension of animation problem, right? It fundamentally changes the problem of, of you know, moving things around in the space and representing them. And so it was a real challenge. And I, I took it as a sort of a temporary measure, not realizing that it was going to be a fundamental career change for me. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, some people have made careers out of adding dimensions in physics, uh, you know, not knowing anybody. Um, yeah. And so, uh, uh, like there was this question that uh, that that as you had published in your sophomore year uh, of of your undergrad, uh, uh, so basically, what kind of effect did that have on your grad school application to uh, 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 to Fermi Lab? Um, well, the the I don't even remember. You know the the way that it works really. Uh, you know the way that it worked for me. I was lucky. Um, that I, as an undergrad, started writing uh, simulation like Monte Carlo simulation for uh, different uh, different experiments. And my undergraduate thesis uh, was about uh, anomalous lifetime in, in, in kaons, like there's a K short and a K long. Um, and so I was using all the data from Fermilab and other experiments, CMS, um, and, uh, and so I was working with all of these people and I was sending them code and talking to them and reading all the papers. And so I, the impression that I get looking back on it, I, I must have written an application because I can't remember, <laughs> okay? But really it was just sort of a continuous thing. It was sort of like, oh, and Mr. Blackley, of course, is gonna be joining us. <laughs> it was that kind of thing, right? Just because it was just like, you know, I was already doing it with them. So I was lucky for that reason, right? And, but that, Familiarity is part of the reason that the cancellation of SSC and the politics around CDF was so devastating for me because it was like my happy family getting very dysfunctional suddenly. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, what was your first reaction to thinking that, you know, after all this great training in physics and, you know, writing papers and stuff like that, you know, probably you, you will be eventually leaving academia because, you know, this is the question that you know most high school students who want to pursue physics or sciences have in their mind that you know uh, possibly whatever we will be doing as you know phds and postdocs and stuff like that that will only allow us to you know become a lecturer or something like that and you know that uh, universities and academia is the only place where scientists mm -hmm. actually you know apply their skills uh, 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 so basically you know uh, you told that you know it was quite devastating for you uh, that the project got cancelled in the way that it was uh, with the academic politics. Uh, so, uh, you know, basically what was your first reaction to thinking that, you know, um, possibly you will be working with your skills as a physicist outside of academia? Well, I wasn't thinking about that. I, I just thought that my, my life was over. I mean, you know, when you're young, you, you know, you tend to overreact to things because you don't have a life, a lot of life experience. You don't have a lot of experience or sometimes some young people, and it was true of me, you haven't overcome challenges in the past. So you don't know you can trust yourself to overcome them. So things seem very dramatic, right? It's like your, your first, the first boyfriend or girlfriend, like, you know, every fight is the biggest fight you've ever had. And if you break up, you're going to die and you're going to jump off a cliff, all this bullshit. And, you know, with some life experience, you understand there's a continuity. So there was a continuity, but you know, for me again, this was really much more emotional because I had come to physics late um, and thought I found my home. And then I felt that home was betrayed. So it was emotional. I wasn't thinking, oh, here's what I want my career to be. And I'm gonna be this kind of a lecturer or do this. So I wasn't really reacting to what that plan was. For me, it was always about 
uh, you know, really the work, right? The beauty of that work. That was the thing that drew me to it. And discovering the politics around it were rotten was a tragic because the work was golden. I mean, even those same people who were behaving so poorly in politics, right? When you talk to them about physics, it was great. It was like being home, right? It was like really good, smart people understood. And, um, and so that was, that was really the, the problem. But look, to answer your question, um, you need to not worry so much. I mean, that's the, the, the lesson here is not that, oh my God, Seamus is such a genius, he worked it out. It's bullshit. I was an idiot and I still am. Um, but things work out. And the worst thing you can do is to get upset about them or try to overthink them because then you start making decisions that aren't going to help you. Okay. One of the things I do is fly airplanes. And there's a great lesson in when you're flying formation with another airplane. Okay. And, you know, you're sitting behind them and they turn and you turn, right? Um, sometimes when you're flying behind somebody because you're flying through an atmosphere that's dynamic, right? You'll see them in front of you, like they're flying along in front of you like this. So you see them in front of you and suddenly their airplane will go whoop like this. And you think, oh, I better like pull up and go up after them, right? No, what's happened is they've flown through some air that's moving up or down. And a few seconds later, you're gonna go up too. And if you just are calm, keep flying, you will automatically get back into formation with them. This is a great lesson. It takes a while to learn it because first you over control, you go, oh shit, you pull up. And then what happens, you go way above them and then you may not be able to even get back. So this is really a good analogy for these situations in life. If you love the science, you're okay. Keep loving the science. It's not gonna matter to your brain if you're doing the science in industry or if you're a lecturer or if you have students or if you have interns. I mean, you're gonna have people that you have to teach. You're gonna have to develop those skills. You're going to have to write. You're gonna have to document what you do for patents and for internal documents, for sharing inside of groups or for papers. You're gonna have to train people either as students or as young workers at your company. You're gonna have the same ups and downs, things that work, things that don't work. All of it can only, it can only be good for you. It can only work for you if you stay focused on the science, if you love that part of it. That's the core of it. That's the thing you need to keep good and pure. So whatever you do, focus on that. All, all the other noise around it will dissipate, okay? This is the great lesson of Boltzmann also, right? Boltzmann, he had to react to all this stuff around him and he was disadvantaged because he was because he was depressed. But if he had just held the course, if he didn't kill himself, three years later, Einstein would have proven him correct, right? So it's about holding the course and loving the work and loving the physics and, and doing good work, just doing good work. Anything that stops you from doing your best work is something you should avoid, okay? Politics, people coming to you say, hey, switch groups. Hey, come over here, do this, do this, do this. When you start thinking about this, like you're gonna be the future fucking Steve Jobs and you're worrying about what color yacht you're gonna buy, you're screwing yourself. You need to concentrate on the work, right? You get the yacht because you've done a lifetime of good work, not, not because, because you thought, you thought about, about the yacht, the yacht. Yeah. Okay? okay? That's, That's really important. important. Yeah, and, and that is actually a brilliant Listen for. Sorry, I, I, I have a dachshund on my lap, so that's that's why I am having strange kinematics. And he's, and he, and he is infinitely cute. I just have to see. He, that. He's also fourteen years old, so he's he's a very senior, and we need to respect him. Okay. Thank you, sir, for joining us as well. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> this is Charles, yes, Charles, Charles, very good. Charles is. Charles is really good with Hamiltonians uh, and 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 cyclic coordinates. Just FYI. Uh, yeah. Uh, so most of my experience of, of you know flying airplanes is in GTA, obviously. Uh, but you know, <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, the new flight simulator is tremendous, also. So. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Uh, and hence, my next question is, you know. How did you like you know? How did you become a pilot as well as a physicist? And you know, obviously, eventually, 
you know the best possibly the best game designer in the world <laughs> i'm not i'm far from the best game designer in the world but i was you know i was lucky to be able to be alive at the right time to be one of the first guys to try some stuff out right and and not screw it up too bad but uh a lot of a lot of uh science and physics guys are pilots and uh, I got into it specifically flying gliders, flying sailplanes, and then doing aerobatics. And it turns out that a lot of science guys do that. Like uh, most of the pilots that I knew were like were science guys. Um, and you know, similarly with some other things like music, a lot of guys, a lot of scientists play jazz, music, violin, obviously, string instruments, because there's something in your mind that it, where it feel it feels the same. And I think this is one of the problems that uh, that always irritates me about the general characterization of scientists as being, you know, not creative or somehow, you know, emotionally bro broken, right? Um, the, the fact is that, you know, in, in my mind, and I think for a lot of people, and maybe for you, uh, if you play an instrument, uh, the process of making music and the process of, of doing theory, it feels very similar. And there's a it, and it's it's there's a dynamic beauty, right? The music is moving. It's not a static piece of art, right? It's a dynamic art, and um, and it's the progression of the notes and the sounds uh, and the vibrating air molecules and the reaction of the people to one another. That dynamical art is the beauty in 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 physics and dynamics and the universe as I see it, and so it fits together. So I would say that. You know, it's the opposite of the case <laughs> that people doing science are blind to beauty. I think that they are that clearly um, uh, able to see a beauty because of all the hard work that others can't. And it's a, it's a, you know, it's a lucky thing. So anyway, all of these things, including baking bread, uh, are things that you find a huge number of technical people, highly technical people doing. And I don't, you know, it's not the result of highly technical people need to take a break from doing the technical thing to do something simple. Not at all. It's that the, the you know, making sourdough bread, for instance, is entire, it's, it's three ingredients. It's three ingredients. And all of the variation and all the quality of things you see comes from technique, which means dynamical beauty, right? The reason that you see scientists doing these things is the opposite of taking a break. It's because it's an extension into other places in the world of the same, same thought process that enables them to do high energy physics, that enables them to do physical chemistry, that enables them to do evolutionary biology. That's why. Yeah. Yeah. Again, you know, I'm just, I'm just, you know, uh, after each and every answer of yours, I'm just uh, saying this. Um, that is again very 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 inspiring um, yeah so my next question is you know uh, you talked about you know getting into looking glass uh, uh, production after Fermilab uh, so you know that was your first job out out of academia uh, yeah right that was your first job out of academia mm, was it yes I think so so my question is, uh, you know, uh, you know. And by, by the way, one of the things it was called Blue Sky at the time, but one of the hallmarks of of that company was that everyone there, <laughs> it was their first job out of academia. The the video game industry wasn't like it is now. Going into video games wasn't a respectable career choice. There wasn't there were no degree programs anywhere. Nobody had any training. Everybody was making it up as they go. People would look down on you. I mean, the the transition from saying I'm a high energy physicist right, when you're having a drink with somebody, to saying, I make video games, was not good then. That didn't get you respect. I mean, now people are like, oh, you must be rich if you're in the game, which is hilarious. Back then it was like, what are you, an idiot? Why, what, you did what? <laughs> um, and uh, 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 yeah, it was, a, it, it, was, it, was, it was an interesting time, but the great trick at Blue Sky, uh, like a lot of places in the early days was that they had evolved a machine for getting people who were who smart, creative people who were frustrated with the academic world into industry by basically creating the perfect environment. So it was just like a university lab, but it was but it was a private company. It was genius. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so basically, if I were to you know make a kind of uh, you know uh, possibly a similarity. Uh, uh, 
uh, so basically looking glass uh, production at that point of time was to game industry and physicist what uh, what possibly the medallion fund and the jim simmons company is to you know quantitative finance and and physicist you know uh, yeah, possibly. Yeah, that's right. It's it's the same. The, the, it was the same technique. Yeah, the same technique, and they both evolve in the same way. You know, blue sky started with a bunch of guys from MIT, and so it got a bunch of course six guys and course five guys out of MIT, like electrical engineers and, and computer science people. Um, and then from there went out to you know to we to Harvard and to uh, you know Boston College and ta ta I don't think. <laughs> many tough people and Rhode Island School of Design and really tried to create this place where it was like not that big a change for people culturally. And then of course, after, after several years, that didn't work anymore and you could start to hire artists and other people normally. And so that kind of atmosphere changed, but to begin with, that was very effective. I'm gonna put Charles down now. He came in my lap. Uh, so basically, you know, after um, uh, uh, like you know, getting into looking glass uh, 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 technologies, you were involved in the making of the system Flight Unlimited, right? Yeah, there, there is a game called Ultima Underworld, and then called System Shock, and then finally Flight Flight Unlimited, which was um, you know I was really into flying at the time. Um, and uh, I owned two airplanes, um, a Pitts special biplane and a, and a sailplane called a Grobe Acro. And um, I was very frustrated with the flight simulators at the time because they, you know, they didn't fly well. And I felt that the point of a flight simulator was to give you the feeling you were flying. And none of these things gave me the feeling that I was flying. And so uh, I decided that it was a great place to apply this newly sort of developed uh, real-time physics engine that I was working on uh, into what a very popular game category. And flight simulation at that time was like shooters are now. It was the number one genre. And so, you know, moving into it was also a savvy business tactic. So it was pretty good. It was a convergence of several trends that, that, that worked out well. Yeah, so after that, you uh, uh, like you started uh, to go uh, uh, like you were um, the executive uh, uh, producer of of Jurassic Park, uh, uh, Trespasser, which was you know uh, based on the film, obviously uh, uh, the Lost World. Uh, mm -hmm. So the Trespasser uh, possibly did not come about well. Uh, so uh, so like, can you elaborate on that? Possibly no. No, uh, so I got recruited by, uh, after after Flight Unlimited, um, Looking Glass started to sort of come apart. And um, it, ironically, the financial success of, of Flight Unlimited um, caused suddenly this little company to be valuable. And so they decided to bring in new management to, you know, change things. And a lot of companies do this. You have to be aware of this. Like when you have success, it can be the worst thing because everyone will then decide, hey, you're having success. Now we need to change everything, which is hilarious because if you're doing something successful, what, why would you Why would you change things? So they did that. And of course, it all came apart. Uh, and so I went to go look for another job. I ended up getting recruited by a new company called DreamWorks in Los Angeles with Steven Spielberg and Jeffrey Katzenberg and, and these guys. And uh, so I showed up for the first day and Steven Spielberg is my boss. <laughs> okay, and uh, I'm like, all right, and I learned about Hollywood. Um, and uh, hold on just a minute. Um, and, uh, you know, I ended up trying to figure out how to use this uh, idea that I had at that point of physics based gameplay and of you know, the dynamical nature of games that, that could emerge, like emergent behavior, player choice, all the things that I talked about when talking talked about game design could be applied to, to Jurassic World um, in the sense of like being a regular person showing up on all these islands and having to deal with it. And I wanted to make a game that would let you feel like you 
you yourself made the decisions that got you off alive, as opposed to it being more of a scripted kind of a situation. And, you know, even now that's a, you know, still a, you know, fairly novel concept, but back then it was crazy. Back then it was like saying, and then we will land on the moon and then we will land on Venus. You know, it was, I was like a madman. Um, and I was young and I was, you know, and I had had a lot of success and, uh, and I was at a crazy movie company where they didn't understand games and it was pretty much a disaster. And I've, I've talked about that a lot other places, but it was a disaster. But I think, you know, the best thing that, that came out of, uh, your work at DreamWorks was that during press events for, uh, uh, for this game, you got to meet Bill Gates and, and that, uh, you know, uh, was the start of a very good partnership professionally. Sorry about that. Yeah. What? Can you ask that again? So I think the best thing that, that came out of your time at DreamWorks was that during press events uh, uh, for this game on Jurassic Park, you got to meet Bill Gates. And, and I think that was the start of of a very good, uh, you know, professional partnership between you two. Uh, so basically, you know, how was Bill Gates when you met him? And, and, you know, how did you two work out together? Well, he had been an investor in uh, in DreamWorks and DreamWorks Interactive, which was the game park that I uh, was working for. And so he came to see demos of what everybody was doing. And I had, at that point, my team had a, 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 a you know, a version of, our technology working that had, you know, dinosaurs walking around using physics instead of animation, which never happened. Certainly I, I didn't know anything. And, you know, we had other objects in the world so the dinosaurs could bump into stuff and the things made sound based on the simulation also. So, and it was all a live sim and nobody had seen anything like that. And so it was like somewhat shocking, right? And so Bill was really impressed and said, boy, you know, you should, you should come work at Microsoft. Um, which was good he said that because I kept that in mind when everything really went to shit and then I went and begged him for a job. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So now to, uh, to probably, you know, the most awaited question. So how did the idea of creating Xbox came about? And, you know, what kind of work did you pursue? And, you know, what kind of work hours did you guys, you know, put together and, you know, creating, you know, possibly again, Sony guys, sorry for this. But you know, possibly the best uh, you know gaming console in the world. Um, well, look, the the, uh, the and, and I I love the Sony guys, and and I have we have lots of Playstations here, uh, and you know, the, weirdly enough, um, I had uh, really you know it's come to think of Sony as the enemy in all of this uh, during that time, and then I met because I hadn't really met at the time uh, the Sony guys, uh, you know Yoshida. Um, Phil Harris and all of these guys. Phil now works for Xbox, or what worked for Xbox and now works for uh, for Google. But um, and they're such nice people, <laughs> and they love games so much. I, I would never would have competed with them if I had known. Um, so no, the the I've talked about this a lot, but the the basic idea for Xbox came about largely because Sony. Uh, had um, an, a, this marketing campaign that came out right around the same time that I started at Microsoft, talking about how the PlayStation 2, the second generation PlayStation, uh, could run Linux and could replace the PC. And they showed a PlayStation 2 like hooked up to a monitor with a keyboard. And this really pissed off people at Microsoft, or some people at Microsoft, right? And at the time, the job that I had there, my first job there was to uh, was to be the program manager of, of, of entertainment graphics. So basically, I mean, on Windows, yeah, yeah. I kept track of everything that had to do with graphics. Um, and, or for, you know, for entertainment, which means all graphics, because the PC is an entertainment device in my, in my view. But... Um, I saw the roadmap, I had the roadmap of all PC graphics and where it was going to go, NVIDIA, 3DFX, ATI, companies that, you know, two of which are gone now. And DirectX, Direct3D, Direct Sound, uh, all of this stuff. And it was clear to me that Sony was full of it, that, that they just didn't understand how fast the evolution of graphics technology was going to happen on the PC. Worse for them was that the PC was the authoring tool used to make PlayStation games. So if you could just get the, the PC architecture under control, you could smoke them. So uh, one night in a long plane ride, I said, hey, we should just 
make a specific PC architecture just to take advantage of all of this and, you know, and keep it consistent so that, you know, this problem that I'd had making games for the PC for like the several years before this of having every PC different and having this weird change in spec and technology always changing, it stops you from making these finely honed games like you can make on a, on a console where the hardware is static. So if we just like define a standard um, and use the, the highest end graphics that's coming out, we could destroy Sony, but we have to have the will to do that. And so I wrote a proposal for this and we ended up, and I showed it to my friend Kevin and we ended up sort of assembling a small pirate group of guys. And um, as we were operating out of the DirectX offices, we called it the DirectX box, the DirectX box spec. And it got shortened to Xbox and there you go. Again, you know, as uh, you know, as is quite often in science, you know, uh, you, you know, it's not, uh, you know, again, I, I would like to uh, 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 to say to the viewers uh, that, you know, I think, you know, um, uh, and probably Mr. Blackley will agree on this as well, that, you know, uh, it's not often in science uh, that, you know, you start a research paper and think, you know, yeah, this is going to happen. These are going to be the results and stuff like that. And, you know, uh, everything is going to work out the way we think at the start of, you know, starting off. So and, boring. Know, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Science wouldn't be the, the way it is. Yeah. Without that kind of, you know, uh, you know, uncertainty and, you know, Heisenberg will, will surely agree on that. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So actually there was this question from, uh, but from the Kar trick is, and this is, this is really important is to keep your mind open. So that when the unexpected things happen, instead of being upset about them and trying to fit everything back together again, have your mind open enough so that you can enjoy them and see them and, and see the beauty in them and see if, see if the universe is trying to tell you something. Because, you know, we ignore what the universe says sometimes because she's very subtle. Okay, but maybe she's trying to tell you something and listen, you should listen because the universe is smarter than you. And the episode of Einstein and the cosmological constant tells that completely right. There are a lot of stories about that. That's right. You know, like she's whispering it to you. Listen. So actually, there's this question from Karanchu, uh, and he's from India. And his question is, you know, how much work went into developing the setup achieved in the final product of the Xbox? And, you know, how much heartache? came from the realization that most of the hardware at that time, uh, you know, uh, was simply uh, not go good enough uh, for, you know, the complexity of some ideas for gameplay. And also on a side note, how much time did you spend waiting for the code to compile? Oh, uh, all right. So one of the things that's important to do when you look back at the past is not to apply your future bias to it. So you look back now and you say, oh, wasn't it frustrating that the hardware was not able to do so much? You got to understand at the time, we didn't know future hardware was going to be amazing, right? We didn't know. But we saw the new NVIDIA graphics chip. We saw the new bus architectures that were coming out. And, and it was exciting for us because the thing holding back PC performance really was compatibility. All these PCs had to have backwards compat with previous PCs and all the peripherals and all the software. And for designers, that really holds you back from getting maximum performance out of any given bit of hardware. So for us, it was exciting because we were removing all those constraints out and making just this pure fastest version of this PC architecture. And that's really what made it come together. So it was the opposite of frustration because we weren't living in the future looking at the past. We were living then and it was awesome. And as to compile time, you know, fuck, half my life is compiled. That's all I have to say. Even now, and that's just how it is. Get 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 over it. Stop using Python. You know, at least with Py at least with when you, when you're compiling things, you spend your life waiting for it to compile, and then it runs fast, right? You know, you, you're running Python. You're wasting your life literally with your code running. So, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Uh but I think, you know, most of the people, you know, uh, living th their lives on, on Jupyter Notebook would not like that comment much, but still, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So my next question is, you know, you went no, into... Okay. I, I, I rail against Python because I'm so dependent upon it and it irritates me so much. Um, NumPy is like my third, is, is like a third of my dreams. But anyway, separate topic. <laughs> 
and i think you know that is you know uh, yeah numpy saipi and you know all those libraries are you know probably you know what dreams are made of for you know most of the people in grad school or or even physicists mathematicians you know anybody who does quantitative work and you know people like you obviously uh, yeah uh, yeah so you went into game designing um, after um, uh, after uh, being in academia doing physics research uh, and you know um, there are uh, uh, as you know uh, way better oh, but by the way i should point out that i was always making games like i i had you know i really got interested in in computers um because of games i always felt that the only good real use of a computer is to play games and sometimes that game can be the compiler sometimes it can be you know python simulation of uh, galaxy formation that's a game and we all know it's a game let's admit it just between ourselves uh and but we pretended serious to get funding um and so I'd been writing games and simulations my whole life along through all of this. And so it wasn't like I decided to suddenly like shift gears. It was really just like, oh, whoa, I could do this all the time. That's actually pretty good. Um, and, you know, I'll miss physics and I'll miss, you know, writing Monte Carlo for, you know, W events that look like top, but I'm not going to miss the politics. So I'll, I'll just do the, the fun part for a bit. Little did I know that the politics and games are just as bad. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah. So this question is actually from someone who wants to remain anonymous. You know, uh, I don't know why, but the question is, you know, uh, besides game designing, there are loads of of stuff which people do after their postdocs. You know, um, as you know, you know, hedge funds. You know, uh, you know, other areas of the tech industry and stuff like that. You know, uh, after doing, you know, possibly, you know, spending their life uh, in, uh, you know, in grad school, you know, five to six years, you know, trying to find the right uh, Lagrangian for everything, you know, uh, they drop all that and, you know, go to Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, you know, all those kinds of stuff and, you know, uh, uh, spend their life. But, you know, obviously, you know, finance industry pays well to faces. Uh, so, you know, in your opinion, you know, uh, you know, how much of a viable career choice has the finance industry become, especially for theoretical physicists? Um, well, I mean, I think it's a viable career choice and I think you can make a lot of money uh, doing that. Um, and, you know, I don't have much experience with it. I, I know people who have gone that route um and you know what i've heard from them is kind of sad um first you know i think money and accruing a lot of money is has become a sort of a false god in our world which is you know causing a lot of trouble but that's just my opinion and second the reports that i hear back from those guys and i know people from the game industry have gone into finance also uh is that you know you're always sort of a second class person. There's a caste system in banking and the banking guys, the guys with finance degrees are the first caste. And if you're a quant, you're seen as like, you know, a janitor. And, you know, it's hard to get past that in, in the world of finance. And I think that that can bring a lot of pain. Um, and I think it's important to be careful about that. Now, that said, you know, the way the markets work and the way that that informs the world and all of that uh, is totally fascinating and really cool. Uh, I just say just, you know, be a little bit cautious. I think that it's maybe not the same kind of friendly family that the game industry can be, that science can be. The world of finance is uh, a little bit meaner. Um, and just take care of yourself, right? Because one of the things about really smart people and people who are able to spend a lot of time thinking about a problem is they tend to be a little bit sensitive, a little bit introspective, and a little bit, you know, sort of susceptible to being bullied a bit. And so just, you know, take care of yourself if you're going to do that, please. Okay. You're, you're, you're magnificent and your brain is beautiful. Don't let it get hurt. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah. So, uh, so after the next question, uh, so in February, 2012, you founded Innovative Leisure, um, and, you know, uh, that was a kind of company which, you know, recruited game programmers to write mobile games. Uh, so, like, you know, can you, uh, you know, explain a bit about, you know, 
how the idea of, of, of going into mobile games came about after you know uh, uh, creating again you know possibly the best game console in the world I love how you just the 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 Sony fanboys are just going to just roast you. It's totally <laughs> awesome. Great. Um all right. Uh um it's so funny too. I have spent more time in the last year playing Switch than Xbox for sure. Anyway, okay. You didn't even mention Nintendo. Um let's see. Uh <sighs> So the, the innovative leisure was like the, so two two things. So I spent about ten years doing finance, like uh, you know, basically doing doing structured finance for video games, which is how I know a little bit about finance. Um, and uh, I left that to do some projects. Um, and one of the projects was this this company, Innovative Leisure, and my idea was that the rise of mobile games offered an opportunity for the kind of experimental gameplay that was taking place in the 80s in arcades. I mean, you know, we look at arcade games as being these obvious classics, right? And here are the different genres and here's what happened, okay? The reality is, seriously, okay, there's a, here's a game about an Italian plumber and a gorilla. Here's a game about a little yellow guy that eats dots and has ghosts chasing him. These are insane concepts, right? These are totally batshit ideas. And that was such a creative time because nobody knew what a game design was. There was no concept of a game designer, right? There were hardware guys. And then, so, then, and then there, suddenly people started to use CPUs because a lot of the early games didn't have a CPU at all, right? There were state machines. Now we have to come up with a new game design. Who designs a game? Well, you take guesses. Okay, here's a car. You know, there are games where you try to hit people with a car. And, you know, and that had this huge public outcry. Okay, well, we'll try something else. Like, how about, it? you know, this? And then they discovered, oh, shooting is fun. Now you can shoot other guys. And then, so, you know, there's a progression of crazy game ideas. And mobile seemed to offer an opportunity to, like, get some of that magic back. And so I thought we'll get some of these original designers who are still, you know, smart older guys who who have some of those crazy ideas and work on those games. And what happened, unfortunately, was that as we did that, during the year we were working on that, we saw the rise of free-to-play games. So the entire business model of mobile changed and wiped out a bunch of business, including us. All our games were, were, were going to be, were not free-to-play, and it was really hard to change them to be free-to-play. So we agreed to just sort of like, okay, okay, you know, we'll stop. We'll part friends. It was horrible. You know, but it, there was a, if you remember in mobile games, there was a year, and this was the year when this happened to us, when the only thing anybody ever played was Clash of Clans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all yeah, there yeah. was. <laughs> and every other game was a copy of Clash of Clans that failed because it couldn't get enough audience. And it was like, ah, things have gotten better now. But, you know, if you were an independent developer who had an idea for something for the next Clash of Clans, all the oxygen had been sucked out of that market. And it was, you know, it was going to be impossible to figure out how to do it. And that's that's been fixed now, which is great. Yeah. And I think the Clash of, of Clans of this age is probably PUBG. And I don't know if you, if, if you like, you know, know about PUBG, but, you know, there are loads of questions in the chat. And, you know, uh, are, you, are you seriously asking me? If I don't know what PUBG is, I mean, can we, <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. with yeah. all due respect, sir, fuck you. <laughs> yeah. it's been, I yeah. would argue, I, I don't know if it's PUBG, so it depends on what platform you look at, you know, but it's games like that, right? I mean, that, that genre, right? Um, you know, on the more commercial side, you have Fortnite. Um, and depending on, on, you know, what your platform of preference is, it's, it's going to be one of those two. And then every other game, I mean, we saw Mass Effect try to have basically a PUBG like structure. Um, we've seen billing structures come into play for that. Now we have this lawsuit with Tim and Apple, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, Tim is one of Tim Sweeney is one of my oldest friends. Um, you know, cause when he was, I, I was doing Trespasser and he was doing Unreal and we would like talk about code and stuff. Um, and for a little while we were going to collaborate on physics. Um, and you know, he's going after Apple because, you know, he feels that Apple's being predatory on his business. Apple feels like, you know, he's sucking all the air out of their market. We'll see how that comes out. Very interesting. Yeah. Go Tim, go, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and from my side as well, go Tim, go. Uh, because yeah, because uh, you know I'm using an iPhone at this point of time, so obviously yes, uh, yeah, yeah. 
so my next question is you know there was this question in the chat uh, you know uh, which is you know quite uh, i would say you know quite introspective uh, and that is you know uh, what kind of you know opportunities you know uh, does uh, this pandemic uh, due to covid offer for game developers and scientists uh, if there is you know any such which you can you know possibly think of well look the I, I get quite irritated with people who say that the, the pandemic offers you so many opportunities to grow and to build your skill set. And that's true if you can pay your rent. <laughs> that's true if you can afford food and it's okay. But, you know, most people are really struggling to, you know, to figure out how to live. Uh, but, you know, the flip side of that is that consumers have um, all of this time now. And, and this has been, I mean, the game industry has had a huge boom during the pandemic, obviously. Um, and so a lot more development projects have started. There's been a lot of activity in the world of financing around funding game developers. There've been acquisition events for game. Uh, the value of game development has gone up during the pandemic for sure. And it will go down again. So you got to keep it, keep an eye on that also. You know, if we, if we can, if the world doesn't end, which we could talk about, but if the world doesn't end, which is a non-zero chance it, it, it will, um, then you know the value of this might go down again a little bit. But really, uh, you know, any time that you can spend, if you're trapped at home, and everything else is okay, right? If you have food and you're safe and all of that, if you're trapped at home, uh, you know, it's a chance, it's an excuse to work on your skills because you have anything else to do. And so, if you're watching Netflix or you're doing something to waste time, look at that. You have this great opportunity. Nobody's gonna nobody's gonna be angry with you for like sitting at home working on something right now. It's an excuse. You're given permission by the world. You're given permission by COVID to to screw around with game development tools and to learn craft. Make a character. Learn about how to make a character jump and it feel good. Learn what the timings are. How many milliseconds can you afford? between a button press and the character doing something. How, how, how many degrees, right, per second should a follow camera move at? When should it zoom? Try to make a follow camera that can follow a character through a doorway and a wall. Can you do that? Is it okay if it flips to be in the room? How do you define where the camera would be in the other room? What if he's going from indoors to outdoors? Right? When your character comes out the door, should the camera still be on her? Should the camera follow her through the door? Should there be a camera up in the sky? What if there are enemies? Now, if there's an enemy behind you, does the camera move around behind you against your will? How do you tell them there's an enemy behind them? Or do you just simply, as a designer, not put enemies in places the player can't see them? You know, I was recently playing Breath of the Wild. Um, I saved Hyrule, by the way, so you can all thank me. Um, and you know, there it's got a lot of a lot of these things it does really well, but there are still problems that we have from from 30 years ago in 3D that that you can play around with. You know, there are um, the Koroks who you know uh, who who you have to catch, and 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 there are several different little games you play to catch them. One of them is that you see sort of this particle trail, and you have to chase it. But the camera has trouble figuring out how to show you where the particle system is versus where you are and what direction to run. And sometimes you like run off a cliff or run into water or into the you know quicksand. And it's really frustrating because it's just clearly a failure of UI. So these problems are still there. And you can experiment with them very cheaply. I mean, you don't need Unity. You know, you can get any free engine and have, you know, the character is a is a is a cube or a sphere. Try these things out. You can do this. And it's and it's fun. Like Get get a bunch of player characters to flock together with one another, have battles, like play around and you'll get emergent behavior. Your half your mistakes will be more fun than the thing you were trying to do. But you're only gonna learn that if you try. Okay. And really, this is giving you permission to try. And that's that's pretty great. I mean, provided that you can afford your housing and your food, because this is just a it's just a, a terrible situation right now. And you know, I think you know uh to the audience, there was a certain person in 1665, uh, you know, who was also going through a pandemic, and he tried some certain things, and you know that is why you know uh, you know uh, you are getting most of the science uh, syllabus at your uh, at your school. Uh, yeah.
and I, and I uh, and we and we we represent this guy as some sort of moron where an apple had to fall on his head and then he was like oh yeah. Like, <laughs> no. yeah. Uh, you know yeah that's right an apple had to fall on his head which suddenly transformed him into a man that could accurately predict the motion of the universe and and in order to describe it he had to oh invent calculus okay fuck you and your apple story it really <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah uh, and so my next question is, you know, what is your opinion on, you know, MM, uh, like, you know, MMORPG and, you know, all those kinds of online games, you know, uh, where, you know, basically, you know, everything is online. It, it, it's not like, you know, uh, any streaming server or stuff like that, you know, like, you know, people ha have servers for, you know, Counter-Strike, Call of Duty, GTA and stuff like that, but, you know, completely online games, you know, what do you think about those games? We, we may have had some of those servers here in this house. Um... Uh, I think that, you know, they're super fun. It's a, it's a style of gameplay. And as I get older and I have more responsibilities, you know, with family and running a company and all of this, uh, I'm, uh, it's less entertaining for me because my, my life is about managing chaos of people doing things that they shouldn't be doing and trying to get them to all work together and all of this. And so I'm not really that interested in doing that for entertainment also. But when you're younger, it, like it's great, and sometimes I still like that. So you know, as I get older, I tend to really crave experiences, you know, like Uncharted, um, you know, or or even Last of Us. They're sort of finely crafted worlds that I can escape to, um, and you know, have an experience different than than my normal experience. But then sometimes, you know, you need to play Mario Kart. Sometimes you need to play PUBG. Sometimes you you know you have to have uh, Smash Brothers uh, because just because. Uh, and then, you know, I, I also enjoy is watching, uh, you know, Dota matches and, you know, looking at that world because the skill of those people, you know, uh, how do I say this in a way that's not offensive? Um, you know, in the, it, you know the, there's, a, there's a convergence there. The skill of the players and the skill of the people who make the games is converging, right? And, and there's this meeting of greatness, right? Uh, it's really interesting to watch. And, you know, I think, you know, uh, it would be, you know, particularly, uh, you know, a very happy sight for you, as you told, that, you know, when you stepped into uh, the video game industry, you know, people were calling, you know, idiot and stuff like that for, uh, for you know, going from being a high energy physicist to a video game designer. But, you know, at this point of time, people are winning millions of dollars, you know, playing video games. So, you know, uh, you know, how would you describe that journey? as a core video game uh, designer who has, you know, overseen the revolution and has been a big part of it. Well, I think that there's, there's, there, it's a little bit tragic, to be honest. Um, the culture of the world has changed and it always will change. Um, but we, we have gone from a culture that really lauded things like the super collider or CERN, great achievements for, for the human race, landing on the moon, these kinds of things. These are great achievements of our species, right? To being really inwardly focused on, on our navels, right? Like, oh, you know, here's a subtle difference between what this player did and what this player did in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a tournament. Or, you know, and it's true of professional sports and it's true of like reality television as well. Um, and, it's more prestigious to be somebody who is has a huge amount of skill at something like that than it is to be somebody who has a huge, huge amount of skill sort of improving the capabilities of the human race. Um, and we need to find a balance between those two things. I don't, you know, I'm not denigrating at all. You know, we have to be entertained. We have to interact with one another. We, you know, we need those things. But we also need to think about the bigger picture of the fact that with a species of people living on this like in, impossibly thin skin on a planet, we may be the only ones, you know, like you can, you talk about, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, the probability of there being, you know, other, uh, uh, you know, all life that, out there communicating with us. And, and there's all, the Drake equation. Talk about, yeah, no, but listen, the Drake equation is pretty good, but it also shows uh, and pretty good, especially for a joke. I mean, you know, I don't know if you know this, but Drake wrote it at the beginning of a conference. Like, okay, let's try this and everybody will shoot me down and then we'll have a good discussion. And it stuck around. Um, but, uh, 
you know, we don't see anything yet. And, you know, and I love science fiction and I read a lot of science fiction and I'm friends with a lot of science fiction authors. And uh, I really believe and hope that I'm wrong, but right now we're all we've got. We all, it's all we see in the sky. And God, it's really important that we keep that in mind sometimes, okay? Like we're not keeping it in mind as well as we might. All right, I have spoken. Yeah, uh, yeah. so my next question is, you know, kind of like, you know, amusing or stuff like that, but you know, what, uh, what is your, your favorite game to play on an Xbox? And, and I think, you know, everyone in the audience wants to know this. And, you know, what is the one game, you know, you would like to live stream y yourself playing, you know, like this, you know, yeah. Yeah, like this. Oh, so. it's the original Halo, Halo 1, man. Why? You know, uh, any particular, you know. Because uh, I have some mad goddamn skills at Halo 1. And in fact, uh, I have considered, I have somewhere um, uh, a an, an, uh, an very early Xbox dev kit um, that has not been updated that has a very early build of part of a Halo level on it. And I've considered getting that up and running again. I'm a little bit scared of the caps on it, so I'll need to take it apart and update the caps. Um, but I might do that soon. But it's definitely Halo 1. That's my that's my thing. And, you know, I spent so much time between that and Dead or Alive, so much time, so much of my life on the road 20 years ago playing that game and demonstrating that game. Uh, and playing it in the hotel room and getting new builds and trying to figure out how to update builds in the internet infrastructure of 1999 and 2000, um, that it occupies, you know, an irreplaceable special part of my life. That is quite, uh, like, you know, that is, you know, uh, again, I think, you know, you will be very familiar with this joke, but you know, that is a love story, uh, you know, way better than Twilight, obviously. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, uh, so currently you are the CEO of of Pacific Light and Hologram, and that is you know a, a very cool name. Uh, and you know, I think you know George Gamow would like it uh, infinitely. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, what kind of stuff are you guys pursuing over there? You know, what do you want to build? I need to. I, I need to. Uh, I, I I need to uh, have a virtual employee now called Mr. Tompkins, don't I? Um, uh, we are building secret things that I cannot talk about. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. That. Yeah, uh, and like before this, you know, uh, like before uh, being at you know Pacific Light and Hologram, you were uh, you were heading the research and development team at Dakrai. So you know, uh, can you at least you know tell a bit about that? No, because it directly resulted oh, in Pacific okay. Light and Hologram. Now, like, look, I I had a. Uh, I have uh, had for many years a laboratory, um, a physics laboratory uh, in Pasadena, California, um, doing various and sundry projects that are very interesting. Um, and um, uh, we did lots of different projects for different people, uh, basically just to fund me being able to buy more equipment, you know, more interesting stuff. And we ended up having a discovery about something that was important. And we got, as a result of that, we got acquired by this company, Dacry. And Dacry started to falter. And so I utilized some of my banking experience and spun us out of Dacry into our own company and got us financed. And that's what we're doing now. I don't mean to sound so cagey, but that's accurate. is you know quite inspiring you know uh, getting yourself out of you know uh, uh, you know obviously a situation which is falling apart and you know creating a new company yeah i would again say that is inspiring and you know uh, i think you know we are towards our our final questions so i take one from the youtube chat uh, so you know um, yeah yeah so enzo dulius wants to know uh, you know uh, wants to you know what do you think uh, the impacts uh, you, you know uh, uh, you know, uh, the impact of, of problems like Fortnite and Apple, you know, 
the problems of, of Fortnite and you know uh, all these issues of Apple can be in the future and you know probably you know most influential people in the world uh, you know will be investing more and more uh, into uh, uh, into the gaming industry as a result of that. Uh, I think, look, the, the, these are emotional issues. Uh, the reality is that um, to be, like, we'll talk about games, but this could be true of anything, right? This is true of the street outside of your house, okay? You can say, gosh, why should I have to pay such high taxes? I don't get anything out of it. But it's just because you've forgotten all the things you get out of it. You have clean water, safe food, cars, traffic lights, rules and regulations for banks that makes it so people don't steal your money. All of the, all these things don't happen for free. You might think they happen for free, but they don't happen for free. Uh, and the same thing with platforms. You know, every platform has to charge a fee. Otherwise, there's no reason for anybody to invest in making the platform. Nobody, would, nobody does it out of the goodness of their heart, unfortunately, but you can't because it would bankrupt you. Right. So you spend a huge amount of money to create an infrastructure. And if we wind back the clock, you remember that the idea of Apple creating the App Store on a phone was stupid. Everybody said it was stupid. There were news articles that said that Apple was going to lose all their money. Apple, Steve Jobs didn't believe in games. Um, you know, I went to meetings. I met Steve a couple of times and he basically spent the time telling me that I was an idiot and that games would never be on Apple platforms, which is hilarious now, right? Yeah. So the, uh, you know, the fact is that, that Apple invested an insane amount of money to make a viable infrastructure and to make, they had to shift world culture so that it made sense to buy apps on a phone. And now it might seem really obvious. Like, well, they just had to set the app store up. No, bullshit. You're wrong. You're not looking at history, right? If you go back to the year 2000 and act, ask an average person if they could buy an online app on their phone, they wouldn't even understand what you were saying. It's not obvious. It takes money and time to set these things up, just like it took money and time to set up the electrical infrastructure that powers your house and the streets outside. And many revisions and different types of concrete and different rules for traffic and different types of gutters and different types of, uh, of, of equipment for moving water out of the gutters and street cleaning and everything else that has to happen to make what seems to you to be really simple and obvious and why should I pay for it? It's not simple or obvious. And you're an idiot if you think that it is. Now, that said, for an economy to function on a platform, the fees have to be right. So I believe that after the initial investment in the platform is made, you don't get to continue being a fat cat and recouping like you just made it. You should reduce the fees. And that's really important to do also. And that's a lesson that we need to learn, but not to zero. And let's not get the idea that, that you know, uh, that it was obvious. You know, if you look at people complain about Amazon and it's unfair business practices and a monopoly and all that, right? Okay, you know, there's merit to those claims. But at the same time, Amazon was a company founded by one guy, literally out of a garage, and then one guy in an office, and he built it from nothing. It's incredible, this story, right? It wasn't obvious. It was not obvious at all. Everyone told him it was insane. He had a very hard time raising money. Now, it's grown to this giant thing. Do they need to take that position in the world seriously? Absolutely, yes. But don't begin your argument about Jeff Bezos is evil and Amazon is evil, thinking that it was some obvious thing that the gods put down on earth since the beginning of time. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. It's important to keep that in mind as you have these discussions. And the same thing is true of all these platforms. I think, you know, in this time, you know, particularly, you know, uh, in the 2010s, you know, and you know, obviously, with the advent of the 2020s, there is one guy who is, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, in in many eyes, you know, the pantomime villain, and you know, in many eyes, you know, probably, you know, the biggest innovator in the world, or you know, a genius. And you know, I think you know, everybody knows about him. Um, uh, you know, it is Elon Musk. You know, he has been, you know, creating, you know, uh, you know, uh, business on on every kind of front, of front, you know. Uh, uh, from space uh, shuttles uh, to, you know, making test lines, stuff like that. Uh, so, you know, what do you think, you know, uh, uh, like about the pursuits of, you know, Elon Musk, you know, on a personal level? 
Wow. Well, I think Elon is an interesting, he's a really fascinating guy to think about. Um, you know, we, we look at other guys like, like Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates, um, who have gone back and forth between being benevolent geniuses to being hated and back, right? Um, and it's, it's kind of, it's, it's interesting. And it, it shows more about our culture than it does about that person, because that person is probably largely the same. You know, these, I know, I, I, I know many of these guys, and they're, they're people, you know, I hate to tell you this, it's disappointing in some ways. They're just guys. They're doing their best to figure out what the hell is going on like everybody else. You know, there's no, <laughs> none of these guys has some deep insight as an evil genius. Like there's no secret room where Bill goes to, to like control the world. But, you know, culturally human beings feel like that's the case. There's a lot, you know, Bill's taking a lot of fear that he's trying to put a chip in every person. And Bill's not trying to put a chip in it, but we feel that way because we're insecure about things and we need somebody to ascribe that to. And we all want to believe that there's, that somebody has a better handle on things than we do. So maybe it's Bill and he's evil that he had, but he's really controlling things. Cause we want to feel like somebody, cause this is a crazy time. At least somebody's controlling something. So Bill's like the victim of this, but he's like a puppet. He's like, what the hell? Why do people think this? Right. He said, no, it, it reflects on us. And, also, something that's going on right now is we're reevaluating our history in terms of the inherent racism and 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 uh, and, and unfairness of 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 the human race throughout history, which is just a true thing. We look and it, and it gets better and worse in different points in history. So we're looking back at figures. We're looking back at Einstein. We're looking back at that at Civil War figure. All these people, and we're saying, you know, they did bad things, and now we hate them. And, you know, is that an overreaction or not? I don't know. It, de it depends on the person. But the thing is, we forget they were people. Just like we forget Boltzmann was a person or or or, or, or Newton was a person or, or Schrodinger was a person with all the same bullshit problems that we have, right? We forget that all these guys were people too. And, and, and a great guide for how we deal with that history, because we have to deal with it. Right, some of these guys were assholes and they shouldn't be lauded. Some of them had problems, but they were pretty good guys, and it's okay. You know, it, it's a spectrum. Um, we have it going on in front of us right now. We have Elon. Okay, he is the brilliant, brilliant guy. He's done such amazing, cool things. Like, if you want to have a billionaire use his money to do cool shit, there, there's your guy, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, but he's also really a whack job. He's a weird, wacky dude. And he says shit that's really uncool. And he says other stuff that's really great because he's a person and he doesn't know how to deal with being Elon Musk any better than you would or I would. He says, yeah, right. And we see a slice of it. That's not the whole person. We just see a slice of it, you know, as we look at him. So here it is in real time. So when we want to look back at Winston Churchill and decide if he was an asshole or if he was the savior of Western civilization, or we want to, you know, look back at Albert Einstein and say, God, he was such a dick to his wife, but he was this great genius. You know, what are we going to do? You know, to get a, 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 you know, a measure of it, you could kind of look at, at Elon Musk and see, hey, right now in our time, in our context, here's this guy doing this great stuff. And he's also acting like a weirdo. You know, let's use that to take a look at some of these earlier guys. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. And, you know, um, and you know, actually, you know, as a commoner, you know, uh, not knowing, you know, any of those guys personally, you know, uh, obviously, you know, most of us think that, you know, uh, whatever we see in their tweets on Twitter or, you know, uh, in their, you know, TED talks and, you know, and stuff like that, you know, is the person who, who, uh, who, who that certain individual really is. But yeah. yeah, but, but that, but that person's TED talk is no more an indication of their personality than any nervous talk you've ever given is an indication of you. Would you want to put like your PhD defense on your dating website? Like, you know, this is the whole thing. It's like, it's not you, it's you under a huge amount of stress trying to be impressive about a topic, you know? And, and I think that we forget that. And, and that's the thing, like all, all these people are just people. And nobody's a super genius who knows everything. Uh, you know, everybody's just trying to figure things out. Everybody has a stomach ache on a day and says some shit they wish they hadn't, or they got in a fight with their husband and they're they're angry or they're feeling super insecure or they lash out at somebody. That happens to everyone, right? It's the the sum total of your character that matters. And look, a lot of these people are terrible people, and they deserve to be like kicked out of history or re reviewed in a different way, right? But they're all just people. They're all just, they're all just people. And, you know, back 
to uh, uh, to one physics question you know this was something which i missed on uh, earlier on so um, yeah so so what was the physics book which taught you the most you know either in undergrad or in grad school you know uh, i think it, it will most certainly not be jd jackson's electrodynamics uh, or you know landau's classical mechanics but you know no, what was that? yeah jackson is a, jackson's great okay don't 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 denigrate jackson uh, but jackson is really a book about solving differential equations it's not a book about electrodynamics first chapter means um, functions the, you know, yeah, it, it should be like, it should be called green. <laughs> um, and it shouldn't be red. Uh, yeah, you know, um, I would have answered differently uh, years ago, but now I think that the, the book that feels most at home to me is uh, uh, MTW Gravitation is, is, is yeah, Meisner, Thorne and Wheeler. Yeah. And like, you know, any particular uh, reason as to why, you know, uh, in the layman language that you can tell, you know, that, you know, MTW is, is well, you know. MTW, so it's not a great book for learning gravitation. I mean, it's not really used anymore uh, by a lot of people. People use Sean, like Sean Carroll's book, even though it doesn't have enough jokes, Sean. Um, but um, it captures the marvel of the subject. And it's a little random, but it's poetic. I really like it. And, you know, it fits so well with the, the view of the world that I have now. Um, you know, there's, there are passages in it that my, my favorite, which I can't quote verbatim, but it's great. I mean, there's opening to a chapter and it basically says, you know, in which we will finally reveal the true inner workings of the universe and all her great beauty. Like it, and it says this. And then it goes on to like field equations, like, fuck you, here we go, hard, as hardcore as it gets, right? But it's because we really are revealing the secrets. Here it is, here's the secret. You've done the work, here it is. It's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and you know, if there was one physics question that you know, you would, uh, you know, want the answer to before, you know, uh, before your life ends, you know, what would that be? Yeah, that's a deep um, question. It, it is a deep question. Uh, boy, you know, if like pick anything, not like uh, a anything, um, I would really, really like to know um, if all of these structures that we see as quantum fields really are all the same thing that we're not seeing the right way. If it really is, if it really is simple, because my intuition tells me it really is simple. And people say, you know, oh, you know, human intuition is flawed, and you know, you're much too big to understand quantum things and all this kind of crap, which is tr maybe true. But we are made of the universe, right? We are the product of all of these laws, and so in that way, I choose to believe that we are uniquely suited to understand it. That's, uh, that's probably the quote which will be written on the top of this interview once this is done. And, you know, I, I'm going to change the title on YouTube for sure. And, you know, I think, you know, uh, that is all uh, for this time. Uh, once again, thank